at 1430 hours local time. Four Ukrainian FPV drones lifted off two kilometers west of the Dnipro riverbank toward four Russian boats they knew were coming. Intelligence suggested these boats would run supplies to observation posts before the sun dropped. What the Ukrainian operators didn't know was that a Russian Lancet had already found them. The FPVs climbed to 10 meters and accelerated southeast, their cameras showing weaving channels and sunlit marsh ahead. The Russian boats, still out of sight beyond the next bend, were already pushing upriver toward the bottleneck Ukraine planned to ambush. The chase had begun, one group racing to deliver supplies, the other racing to intercept, and both sides were closing the distance fast. But the Russian Lancet drone was closing in faster. The first warning came from the Ukrainian spotter. The lead operator looked up from his screen just long enough to see a black dot against the clouds, dropping fast. The dot became an unmistakable triangle. Russian Lancet 3, diving directly toward their position. His FPV feed still showed his drone six kilometers downrange, but that no longer mattered. The strike drone was inbound. He didn't wait for instructions. He ripped the primary antenna cable free, grabbed the backup connector, and bolted for the trench. His partner was already sprinting towards the secondary control point 500 meters away. Above them, the Lancet steepened its dive, Seeker locking onto the heap loom of two Ukrainian operators exactly where they had been sitting seconds earlier. Three seconds to impact. The two men threw themselves into the timber-reinforced dugout as the Lancet hit their previous position behind them. The blast punched a column of dirt 20 feet into the air. Its three-kilogram shaped charged warhead formed a copper jet that could pierce steel. But here, it carved a crater through the earth and timber. But overhead, nothing stopped the Ukrainian drones they had already launched. The FPVs were now two and a half kilometers into their route, crossing their first checkpoint, a destroyed wooden bridge that served as a navigation reference. The Russian boats were still navigating upriver toward the same general area cutting wakes through narrow channels. If the Ukrainian teams didn't re-establish control soon, they'd risk losing signal before the drones reached the intercept point. That was where the ubiquity mesh network came in. When the primary control node went dark, the mesh behaved exactly as designed. Five radio nodes were spread across five kilometers, each one checking its neighbors 10 times a second. As soon as the first node failed, the routing tables updated in 100 milliseconds. The authenticated backup node took over in 50 milliseconds total. So fast, the drones never realized anything was wrong. Their outbound course held steady, telemetry unchanged. The FPVs crossed a shallow basin. Battery indicators showed 85% remaining, enough to reach the target area and some backup to spare for evasive maneuvering. But the operators had a new problem, range. When the team forced to evacuate deeper into the trenches, they were now falling behind the FPV's forward progress. Every meter they retreated widened the distance between the drone and the controller, and at six kilometers, signal degradation would begin. The backup team had to move toward the river, even though that meant exposing themselves to where Russia would expect follow-up teams to be. The second team grabbed spare batteries, spectrum analyzers, and fresh antennas, then began advancing east through zigzag trenches carved shallow into the delta mud. Standard Russian response time to a confirmed Ukrainian node was three minutes. They had just survived a Lancet strike. Mortars or a second drone would be next. They had to move fast. Meanwhile, the FPVs passed their second checkpoint, a cluster of collapsed fishing huts that marked the entrance to a maze of channels leading south. Yesterday, the Russian boats had used the northern route. Today, the FPV cameras showed nothing there. The Russians had shifted three kilometers south, forcing the Ukrainian drones to extend their search pattern deeper into the delta. This change had cascading effects. Extending the search meant the operators had to keep pace. The backup team pushed forward again, slipping between mud berms and low trenches as their spectrum analyzer showed no Russian emissions yet. That wouldn't last. The Russians monitored these approaches too. They would expect Ukrainian operators to move toward the water after a Lancet strike. The attackers often use that predictable movement pattern to coordinate follow-on shots. 800 meters from the river, the second team reached a firing position barely two feet high. It offered line of sight for a clean signal, but almost no cover. They dropped into the ground behind it, reconnected antennas, and restored full-quality FPV video feeds just in time. Ahead of them, the FPVs were entering the outer delta channels. 
battery level showed 65%. The river geometry was beginning to match map overlays. Marsh gave way to narrow cuts where Russians would be forced to slow. The expected bottleneck was still a kilometer away. But as the operators settled in, a crack echoed from across the river. A sniper had found them first. The sniper's first round cracked overhead and missed. The second might not. The shooter had a clear lane across 600 meters of open water, giving him every advantage. No wind, no mirage, no terrain to hide behind. The Ukrainian team had barely settled into their firing slit when the second round tore past, passing close enough to feel the pressure wave. The spotter rose into a half crouch, exposing himself just long enough to laze the shooter's position. His laser rangefinder returned distance within a single meter, giving him elevation, inclination, and a compass bearing. Combined with the map sheet strapped to his forearm, that gave them a 10-digit grid accurate enough to direct fire almost on top of the sniper. His partner was already keying the encrypted radio, calling Kherson for immediate suppression with the kind of urgency that needed no explanation. The call followed the standard sequence, grid first, target description second, danger close warning third, and a request for immediate suppression last. 600 meters counted as danger close, meaning even minor ballistic errors could land shells on the Ukrainian team. Under normal conditions, a single officer confirmed the firing solution. Under danger close, three officers independently verified the grid, the fire control data, and the relative positions of friendly units. Powder temperature was checked twice because hotter propellant increases muzzle velocity, which shifts impact points. Barrel wear was logged. The firing angle had to be exactly right. The fire detection center pushed the coordinates into his digital system, which calculated the ballistic solution automatically. Air temperature, humidity, propellant burn characteristics, tube wear, even the minor lateral drift reduced by Earth's rotation were all factored into the firing data. But the observer still had the hardest job. He had to watch the fall of the first round, and watching men exposing himself again. To understand what came next, it helps to know how artillery measures angles. Instead of degrees, crews use mils, 6,400 mils to a full circle. One mil equals roughly one meter of lateral shift at a kilometer of distance. It's simple math under fire. If a round impacts 50 meters left of the target at one kilometer range, the observer calls right 5-0. The guns shift 50 mils right. No complicated trigonometry, just meters to mils, one to one. The solution for this mission required 289 mils of elevation and 3,426 mils of deflection. In plain language, the guns needed to lift the tube to arc the shell across 18 kilometers and aim slightly to the right to land on the far bank. When the gun captain confirmed the firing data, the battery commander gave the order. A moment later, the first 155mm M795 projectile left the tube at 827 meters per second. Time of flight, 47 seconds. The sniper fired again. The third shot cracked through the air and punched into the berm a foot from the spotter's elbow. The shooter's Didal NV optic with integrated range finding removed the guesswork from his side. Across water, there was no wind to push the round off course. Each shot was walking tighter. The observer rose again, putting one eye to his mill dot reticle. Through the glass, the first artillery round struck 50 meters left of the target, sending reeds and soil into the air. Not enough. He measured the deviation and keyed the radio. Right 5-0, add 2-5. In Kesson, the gun line shifted the tube slightly right and raised it a fraction of a degree, just enough to extend the range by around 25 meters. Within 30 seconds, three more shells were airborne. Each projectile carried 10 kilograms of Composition B, a standard military high explosive used throughout NATO's 155mm stockpile. With a 50-meter lethal radius, a direct hit would silence the shooting permanently. The second volley arrived in rapid sequence. The first impact detonated short. The second exploded long. The third landed directly on the sniper's firing point, erasing it in a rising column of earth and shattered vegetation. The far bank went still. No more shots came across the water. The Ukrainian team took the pause for what it was, a window, not safety. They signaled the third team two kilometers north. Three fresh FPVs spun up, gaining satellite lock and orienting south toward the channels where the first wave had vanished into the maze. The third team was untouched. Their drones would be back up in case anything went wrong. The operators at the berm reconnected antennas and checked their screens. 
Their original FPVs were now deep in the southern channels, battery indicators dipping below 60%. The water grew darker between the reeds. The delta narrowed into tight corridors where the Russians would have to commit to one path or another. On one feed, sunlight flashes across a ripple. On another, moving wakes cut across the surface. Heat signatures advanced through the channels, clustering in a tight column. Four shapes, four engines, four Russian boats pushing hard toward the bottleneck. The Ukrainian operators steadied their hands and began pushing new coordinates into the system. Everything that happened next would occur in seconds, and the third team's drones were already airborne, closing fast. But now the Ukrainian drones weren't the only ones up looking for targets. The first Russian FPV appeared at 2 o'clock high, second at 9 o'clock low, third coming head on. The Russians had learned to hunt in packs, each drone covering a different escape vector. The Ukrainian operator's spectrum analyzer showed three signals on 5.8 gigahertz, each 25 milliwatts, creating electromagnetic beacons at two kilometers. But this drone was transmitting too. Mutual detection, mutual hunting. Everyone visible to everybody. That's because detecting drones is easy for both sides. Every FPV drone not using a fiber optic cable transmits signals back to its operator. That transmission is omnidirectional, broadcasting in all directions like a light bulb, not focused like a laser. Any receiver within two kilometers can detect that 25 milliwatt signal, even if they can't decode the video. The Russians had learned to use cheap spectrum analyzers, $40 on AliExpress, to show every transmission in the area. See a spike at 5.745 gigahertz? That's a drone. Signal getting stronger? It's getting closer. Multiple signals, multiple drones. The Russians had also developed ram drone doctrine specifically for the Delta. Traditional air defense doesn't work here. Too low, too slow, too small for missiles. Jammers cost $50,000 and affect your own drones. But an FPV costs $500. Launch six, lose five, destroy one Ukrainian drone, still cost effective. They pre-positioned operators every two kilometers along the river, each with 10 drones ready. When Ukrainian drones appeared, they launched everything they had. The lead Russian FPV dove from above, aiming for the blind spot above the Ukrainian drone's camera. The operator caught the shadow growing on his screen and barrel rolled right. The Russian missed by two meters, pulling up hard. But this was the trap. The second Russian FPV was already positioned where the Ukrainian would evade to. The Ukrainian operator cut the throttle completely, dropping like a stone. The second Russian overshot, expecting maintained altitude. But dropping meant getting closer to water where the third Russian drone waited. The physics of drone ramming are brutal. You're trying to hit a pizza box sized target moving at 100 kilometers per hour while you're also moving at 100 kilometers per hour. Both operators have 250 milliseconds human reaction time. The video feed has 50 milliseconds latency. By the time you see the target, react, and send the command, your drone has moved eight meters. Their drone has moved eight meters. You're aiming where they were a quarter second ago. The Ukrainian pilot pulled up hard, motors screaming at maximum RPM, barely missing the third Russian drone that tried to rise to meet him. Now all three Russian FPVs were below him, having to climb against gravity while he could dive using gravity. He banked toward the sun, knowing their cameras would wash out in the glare, buying precious seconds. But more Russian drones were launching. He could see them on screen, small dots rising from concealed positions. Four, five, six FPVs converging on his location. They didn't need to be good, they needed to be numerous. Eventually, one would get lucky. The ramming attacks had another purpose. Even if they missed, forcing Ukrainian operators to evade constantly degraded their ability to complete missions. Every evasive maneuver burned their batteries. Every second spent dodging was a second spent hunting boats. The stress accumulated, knowing that six enemy drones were hunting you while you tried to hunt boats while your battery died and mortars were probably already being aimed at your team's position. Some operators cracked under the pressure, aborting missions at 50% battery. Others pushed until their drones fell from the sky at 0%. But that was not happening today. The Ukrainian operator's peripheral vision caught what he'd been searching for. Four Zodiacs in channels below, not the three expected. They were running in column formation through a 10-meter channel, unaware of the drone battle developing overhead. Battery indicator had turned amber at 
35%. The operator made his choice, marked the boat's position for the second wave already launching and the other three still in the air, then evade or go down trying. He transmitted coordinates while climbing straight at the nearest Russian drone in a game of chicken. The Russian pilot broke right, deciding his drone was worth more than preventing observation. The Ukrainian FPV maintained lock on the Zodiacs until battery went out at 20%, the drone falling into the marsh somewhere unrecoverable. The Russian Zodiacs, warned by their drone operators of Ukrainians above them, split up down different channels to make it harder to hit them. It didn't do them any good, though. Three fresh Ukrainian FPVs arrived at attack speed from the north and joined the other three drones. They all split to engage from different angles. The lead Zodiac took a direct hit at the waterline where tubes attached to the rigid floor, the structural weak point. 300 grams of RDX created by 50 PSI overpressure, rupturing the 3.5 PSI rated tubes instantly along their seams. The second boat attempted to reach the reed bed, but Zodiacs require 30 meters turning radius at speed in a 10 meter channel. The FPV compensated for the boat's movement and struck the transom, disabling propulsion. The third boat's operator tried to make it to a bank of reeds to hide. Needless to say, it didn't make it there. The fourth boat got lucky and breached itself in high reeds, its crew thinking concealment meant safety. But thermal cameras don't care about visual concealment. Three human heat signatures clustered around a warm engine glowed against cool vegetation. The remaining drones took turns dropping grenades on the beach Zodiac. The 30mm grenades weren't meant to sink boats, they were anti-personnel weapons with a 5-meter lethal radius. But soon enough, the boat was turning to ash in the marsh. Four boats eliminated, critical supplies that wouldn't reach observation posts by nightfall. Those posts would be abandoned after dark, leaving five kilometers of riverbank unmonitored for 72 hours. The Ukrainian operators were already displacing again, staying ahead of mortars and more Russian lancets that were certainly coming. Tomorrow, the Russians would try a different approach. Tomorrow, Ukrainian operators would be waiting with fresh batteries. Bye for now.